morning. This, uh, this chapel actually was supposed to take place the week of Martin Luther King's birthday. I was supposed to preach this message that week. And by the hand of Providence, we got snowed out. Praise the Lord, right? But by the hand of Providence, I'm going to preach the message that I was going to preach then, this week. And it's fitting that I do this. Because a week ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I was going to preach the message the week of his birthday. And I'll preach this message a week after his assassination, 50th anniversary. I've grown up having an interest in my background as a family in genealogy and I found out some things about my, my background. One, one thing I found out was, and it wasn't hard, a name like McKnight, you know you're going to be some frame, form, or fashion of Scot Scottish or Irish or something like that. So what I found out was that my family came from Scotland and they moved to Ireland and then we came over to the colonies around the 1700s and that's my dad's side of the family. And then I started looking at my mom's side of the family. I found out that they came over pretty early and uh, around the time that the colonies were settled. As a matter of fact, I found out one thing about one of my relatives. And, you know, when you do genealogy and you find out about your family history, you're not always happy about what you find. And so I found out that one of my relatives actually stole the Bible from a meeting house in Massachusetts and got put in the stockade for it, you know. So it's these things to be proud of with your family. But I also found out from my mom's side of the family that my great-great-grandmother uh, was probably Cherokee Indian. That's what I was told. And it kind of made sense to me because throughout my life, I've always had to kind of a, a, I've always been a white guy, but I've had like a darker skin tone than most of the folks that I knew that were Caucasian. Matter of fact, when I go into the Middle East and, and I lead tours there because I get to go to Israel and lead tours there, as I'm in Israel, usually what will happen is I will have the Israelis talking to me in Hebrew because they, they, they think I'm a Jew. And then I'll have the folks who are Palestinian and, and, and from an Arab background speak to me in Arabic because they think I'm an Arab. Now, for the Israelis, I can say Boker Tov, which is good morning, and I can say thank you, which is Toda. But once I get past that, oh, Shalom, for Dr. Kribb, Shalom Aleichem. But once I get past that, that's it. So it's a pretty short conversation. It's mistaken identity. But the reason why they do that is because my skin has an olive tint to it. I've always wondered about it. So I started looking and researching a little bit about my great great grandmother and I saw a picture of her that that was supposed to show her uh, sitting with a family and and I looked at her and she's supposed to be Cherokee but as I was looking at that picture I said I don't think she looks Indian I think I'm gonna do a DNA sample and see if I can find out if I have Native American blood I didn't just do one DNA sample I did two and I did it because all through my life, when we're checking off boxes for race, every time I check Caucasian, I'm like, do I really fill this out? Because I feel like I'm red. You know, my mom always had told me that she was an eighth Indian, which would have you know, given her scholarships. But the story was that my, my great-great-grandmother was a full-blooded Cherokee and that she married out of the tribe. And when that happens, you lose your name and you lose all your privileges. You get kicked out. So you don't get any scholarships. You don't get any minority privileges as a Native American. So she never had it. But I was a little sus suspicious when I saw this picture. Because the person in the picture I saw did not look Native American. They looked African American. So I said, well, I'm going to send my DNA out and see what happens. Well, that caused a stir throughout the whole family, and everybody started swabbing. You know what I'm saying? And spitting and sending it out to Ancestry.com and you know, all the other, so it started just a whole, whole trend. I'm just a trendsetter there. And what we started getting back was we were finding out some things about our family history that maybe didn't match up to the story. I found out that my mother has a strong genetic heritage in Africa. 
I found out that she has ties to two of the Western African countries from which the slaves came during colonization. I found out that she has a North African heritage that actually specifically goes back to Israel as well. So when you look at it, it looks like Morocco, Libya, Algeria, Egypt, and then Israel. And so if I look at my map genetically, I can see that. And I also found out that we have the, I have about 20% Iberian. Well, that's Spain, right? That doesn't make sense. Well, if you know anything about church history, the folks in North Africa invaded Spain. Needless to say, we found this out about mm, three months ago. And it has caused quite a stir in the family. Because now we're trying to figure out who was my great-great-grandmother? And for me, that's an exciting thing. Because for me, I was like, you know what? I really don't care if it's Cherokee or if it's African. I just want to know the story. Because I've grown up in foreign cultures. I was born in Germany, but I'm not German. Both my parents are American. They come from eastern Kentucky. No jokes about that. But I've grown up all over the world. And my mom taught me this song as I was growing up because I thought I was red. And so the song really helped me out because I was thinking, you know, what category do I fall in? And you guys may know it. You know, it's the, story, it's the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. All the children of the world, say it with me. Red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. Now watch this. I don't think we have enough colors in that song. I think we need a few more. So if your color's not in that song, you put it in. Because it's the spirit of the song. It's not the, you know, it's not, we're not going to be pharisaical here. But I remember that song and I remember the picture that I saw in churches that we had throughout the world where we had people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping with us. Whether it be Berlin, Germany, whether it be Okinawa, Japan, or whether it be in in the year 2000, when I went to the Billy Graham conference of itinerant evangelist, and literally I had people from all over the world singing praises to God in their own language. And as I, as I was standing there in Amsterdam, it reminded me of a passage of scripture from Revelation 7, verse 9. It says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What a picture. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You understand, you hear this is happening where? In heaven. And in heaven they're talking about people from what? Every tribe, tongue, and nation. It begs the question, how did they get there? Why, well, I'm so glad that you asked that question this morning. I'm going to use that little song that my mama taught me to take us there. So bear with me, if you will, for you preaching professors, you're going to be frustrated because it's not an expository message. But I will try to be true to this text. So the first point is this, red and yellow, black and white. We all have God-given value. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Red and yellow, black and white. We all have God-given value. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Folks, I want to tell you, 
God created us all with both value and diversity. In Psalm 139, 13 and 14, David says that you knit me together in my mother's womb. And and the words that he uses there are words like knitting together a tapestry like you would hang in a castle. It's fine needlework. And it's a beautiful picture of God taking a personal interest in every detail of you coming to be who you are. The Bible says in verse 14 that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I look at this campus and I look at this auditorium and I see people of different colors. I see people who have hair and I see people like me. And in our diversity, I see people who are created in the image of God. Because you are created in the image of God, you have inherent value. You have God-given value. That God would love you enough that he would breathe life into you. Do you understand that the Bible says that Christ is the one through whom everyone is created? You have been created through Christ Jesus, just like you are. Some of you this morning may be looking at your identity and you may be thinking, and you may have been told this all your life, you'll never amount to anything. You're not worth anything. You've got no future. Or you may be looking at your family history and going, well, look where they came from. Look where they were and look where I am and I'll never be where I think God wants me to be. I wanna, I wanna share with you a truth from God's word this morning. You're created in the image of God. He loves you enough. He takes a personal interest in knitting you together just the way that you are. When we talk about this idea of racism, we understand racism is not a political issue. Racism at its core is a gospel issue. Because if we are putting someone down because of their race, what we are saying is we are saying someone was not created the way that God wanted them to be created. That maybe God in his wisdom didn't really understand what he was doing when he caused the diversity that he caused in the human population. And what we do is we start to categorize people into subhuman categories. That's what racism does. And I understand because I've been in the military and I've seen it happen. I've been a chaplain. It's hard to get soldiers to want to kill another human because that's pretty big stuff. And it should be. And so in the past, World War II, what we did is we called these subhuman categories for the Japanese and we called them nips. And we called these subhuman categories for the Germans and we called them krauts. And then Vietnam came and we called them gooks. And they had Somali and we called them skinnies. And the role of me as a chaplain was to bring out to my soldiers, listen, there's no place for that in the kingdom of God. We're all created in his image. In order for me to be a racist, I have to show that someone else is somehow less human than me. And when I get to a point that I start taking away from someone being in God's image, that's exactly what I start doing. That's what happened when you dealt with chattel slavery. I don't know my great-great-grandmother's story, but I can speculate. I can speculate how she got into our family. I can speculate definitely how she got to the colonies. And I thank God for men like William Wilberforce, who fought against the slave traffic and fought against the practice of treating Africans as subhuman beings. And to get us a little example of what this looks like to treat someone as subhuman, I want you to watch this clip. That the slave traffic was wrong because it was an attack upon the image of God. That we are all equal because we're made in God's image. You see, the first step to seeing people from every tribe, tongue and nation in heaven is seeing everyone as someone made in God's image. Whether they be in Jakarta, Indonesia, Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world where we have 
a partnership with a seminary as Anderson University? Why would we care? Because God cares about people from every tribe, tongue, and nation because they're made in God's image. If we're going to have people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, we must support the intrinsic value that each of us have because we have the same creator. But there is a problem, isn't there? The reason why we have racism is because red and yellow, black and white, we all sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. Jesus says in Matthew 5.48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. I don't know about you, but if I'm, if I'm trying to, to gain access to God based upon my perfection, I'm toast. My wife's here this morning. And I know some of you guys who have me in class think I'm a perfect person. She'll tell you you're wrong, right? And you're not perfect either. We don't do the thing that we need to do and the thing that we shouldn't do, we do that. All of us fall short. I love the saying that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Doesn't matter what race you're from, doesn't matter what tongue you speak. We all have sin in our life. And here's the problem. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. And all of us, if we're left in our sin, will experience that. A tragic trajectory. But that's not the end of the story. It says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the next point I want to tell you is that red and yellow, black and white, Christ Jesus died for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Some of you know this verse. I want you to recite it with me out loud. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. No distinction. No distinction of tribe. No distinction of color. No distinction of race. Jesus Christ died for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the good news of Scripture and the gospel is that whoever will come to Christ can have salvation, can have forgiveness of sin, can have life. Why? Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We all have sin, red and yellow, black and white. But we all have access to a Savior who is Jesus Christ. And because of that, red and yellow, black and white, Christ calls his followers to make disciples from every ethnic group, from every nation. He says in John 28, 19 and 20, he says this. As you are going, make disciples of Pantata Ethne, all the nations. Where's that? That word ethne sounds familiar, does it not? It's where we get the term ethnic from. You look at China, they have hundreds of ethnic groups. Here's what Jesus says. He says to you, Christ follower, take the gospel to every ethnic group in China. Why? Because Christ died for them. So he calls us. How can every tribe, tongue, and nation come to heaven? Because we are called to take the gospel to them. Paul says in Romans 10, how can they believe in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear? without a preacher, without someone bringing the gospel to them. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God calls all Christ followers to share the gospel with people of every race. Red and yellow, black and white, fill in the other color. God calls us to share Christ with them because he loves them and they're made in his image. Red and yellow, black and white, we are one in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 3, or I'm sorry, Galatians 3, 28, when he says this. He says, therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. In Romans 12, 15, he speaks of that unity in Christ. And he says, how are we to, to act together as the body of Christ? He talks about the fact that when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And he says in Romans 12, 15, that we should rejoice with those who rejoice. And we should weep with those who weep. So when I have brothers and sisters in Christ who are here, they may be of a different race. I may not understand their context. When they are weeping, I should weep. When they're hurting, I should hurt. When I have brothers and sisters of Christ who are in another country and they're being persecuted for their faith, I should weep. I should hurt. If one part of the body is affected, understand the body is not just a local church. The body is the church, big C. If one part of the body is affected, the whole body is affected. And so we weep with those who weep. And we rejoice with those who rejoice. We see a little bit of that in this next clip. I don't know if Julius Clay or Gary Brashear were believers, but I do know if we see a picture of what it means to weep with those who weep there, how much more as we of the body of Christ should we exemplify that type of empathy? The Bible says that red and yellow, black and white, we are all part of the body of Christ as believers. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And then it says red and yellow, black and white, God's grace covers the sin of the whosoevers. I don't know where you are today in your walk with Christ. I don't know whether you are following him or thinking about what it means to have a relationship with him. Maybe you're skeptical. But I want to give you this, that regardless of where you are, Christ died for your sins past, present, and future. He saved a man by the name of Saul, who was a capital murderer, he murdered Christians in the early church, and he became Paul, the greatest missionary in the history of the church. He saved a man named Don, John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader in England who carried slaves on a ship like the Madagascar. But he's also the same man who wrote the hymn after his conversion, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hear his story in this next clip. As the band comes up, Peter writes in letter to the church about the death of Christ Jesus. You remember Peter, don't you? He denied Christ three times. Something that he may have thought would be unforgivable. But at the end of John's gospel, we see Jesus say, Peter, do you love me? Three times. And Peter answers him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And three times he tells Peter, feed my sheep, and restores him. And Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You see, on, on the cross, through the grace of Christ Jesus, for people of every tribe, tongue, and nation, Jesus Christ died for your sins past present, and future. You may not be a slave trader like John Newton, but you've got sin in your life. 
The good news is Christ can forgive you. You may not be a murderer like the Apostle Paul, but you've got sin in your life. Christ died to forgive you. He simply asks you to turn from yourself, turn from your sin. To trust what he did on the cross for you, that he lived a perfect life that you and I couldn't live. And he died a death that he that we deserved, taking our sin upon him so that we could have forgiveness. And then surrendering our lives to him. And he did that for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Let's pray.